What's up, A-Push World? We have Chapter 28 of Alan Brinkley's American History for you today. We are getting so close to the end. The exam is near. You are going to do awesome, and I will hopefully clarify lots of important info from Chapter 28 for you. So let's get going. Let's talk about the economic miracle of what is known as the 19. 50. So why was there economic success after World War II minus some short-term inflation in the immediate years? Well, we have a lot of government spending, especially on something known as the interstate highway system, which we'll talk about a little later. The baby boom generation, those that are between 1946, and you'll hear certain dates, it varies on when it ends, but most people can agree it ends in 1964 with the, with the creation of the birth control pill. This created a large consumer demand. You have 75 million children are born during this time and that in, in the population increases drastically you also have the growth of suburbs which increased home and automobile purchases especially automobile purchases those skyrocket during the 1950s so what are some industries affected by the automobile well you have housing and oil and oil especially in texas you also have rubber industries and and lots of other industries as well this term, the Sun Belt, you should be familiar with, and the Sun Belt grows during this time. And you'll notice all these states that are in red. This is a 15-state area from South Carolina through Florida all the way over to California. It's called the Sun Belt because it's pretty darn warm there. And this grew at a rate twice as fast as the Northeast, which is known all as the Frost Belt because it's called and also the Rust Belt. But the Sun Belt is going to grow quite drastically and you'll see especially older individuals begin to move south there's a direct correlation between the weather and the amount of people that live and that are moving to certain areas unions during this time agreed to what are known as escalator clauses in their contracts and this is an automatic pay increase that is in line with the cpi or the consumer price index which determines inflation strikes became less frequent during this time in the two famous large unions, the AFL and the CIO, merged into one union. The Taft-Hartley Act also hurt unions, remember that from Chapter 27, because this outlawed the closed shop. So this is going to have an impact on unions and that union membership will decrease. Let's talk about science and technology. There are some new medical advancements. There were many before the 1950s, including antiseptic solutions and penicillin, but in 1954, there was the polio vaccine that was invented by Jonas Salk, and he provided free vaccines for the entire nation. That's pretty incredible when you think about it, that somebody creates a vaccine and it is given away for free. And this helps save many lives and also improve the quality of life of many others. DDT pesticide is used and it's harmful to insects, but at the time during World War II when it was introduced, it wasn't believed to be too harmful to humans, but it's very important to know this, and we'll come back to this book later, but in 1962, Rachel Carson writes a book called Silent Spring, and this is all about how harmful pesticides were, and this is a very very, very frequently tested topic on the multiple choice portion of the AP exam. So definitely know Rachel Carson wrote Silent Spring, which was about pesticides on the the harmful effects of pesticides on the environment. This is influential in creating the EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency in the 1970s. In 1952, the U.S. has the hydrogen bomb test, which is much more powerful than the atom bomb, and the Soviet Union successfully tested their own the very next year. The space program becomes very important during this time. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched a satellite that this is a replica of called Sputnik. It's about 23 inches in diameter, and this was the first satellite launched into outer space. This has huge ramifications in the United States. The United States feels like they are lacking severely when it comes to science and technology, so they responded by increasing spending on science and education in the United States. Definitely know that Sputnik causes an increase in spending on science and education in the United States. In 1958, NASA was created. And on April 12, 1961, this guy, Yuri Gagarin, became the first person in outer space. He is from the Soviet Union, so now they are up two to nothing. But let's go back to that date, April 12, 1961. Hmm, what happened? Well, we had the Civil War on that day. 1861, that's the start of the Civil War. FDR died on that day in 1945, but I think something happened before that. Even before the Civil War started. Oh my God, it is Henry Clay's 185th birthday. Yes, April 12th. 
1777 Henry Clay was born. Who would have thought you'd be watching a video on the 1950s and 1960s and you'd still be learning about Henry Clay? Look at him. He looks great for 185 years old, huh? And the Soviet Union is leading this space race again to, to nothing against the United States. But the United States does come back and eventually win as we will see. Bye, Henry. We'll see you later. So let's talk about rise in consumerism. Consumer credit increased drastically in the 1950s. You see credit cards becoming very popular and store cards as well. Car manufacturers produced newer, more stylish cars every year for a very long time. The Model T was the same for, I think, like 12 years in a row. Then car companies realized, hey, we can make some changes every year and sell more cars. Many new appliances were introduced during this time. Houses were more frequently had dishwashers, garbage disposals, and especially TVs, this brand new invention, although it was black and white at the time. Disneyland in the 1950s became very popular as a tourist destination. And let's talk about the Federal Highway Act of 1956. You can see all of these lines crisscrossing the United States is the interstate highway system. Now, I live right here in Buffalo, New York, and it's very simple. When I want to go to Cincinnati, I hop on this little line here, and I go woo, 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 about six and a half hours down. Sometimes if I go really fast, I can make it in six hours and 15 minutes, but don't tell my mom. This created more than 40,000 miles of highways throughout the United States, and it was the largest government work project in United States history. This really helped stimulate the economy in many ways. And Eisenhower authorized this in part because it would be beneficial in case of a nuclear evacuation. So if the United States had word that a nuclear weapon, a nuclear bomb was going to be launched, people could jump on the highway and evacuate major cities. So what is the impact of these highways? Well, the railroad industry was negatively affected because now more companies are shipping goods via trucks. The hotel and motel industry drastically increased. And you also have the growth of fast food industries, especially McDonald's. And of course, suburbs are affected as well people are now moving further away from work because they can travel further so let's talk oh by the way how would henry clay feel about the interstate highway system what do you think would he like it or would he dislike it i hope he said he would like it because part of his american system was internal improvements building of roads and canals so he would be very proud he eisenhower was channeling his inner henry clay when he proposed that Maybe not, but it sounds good, right? So let's talk about suburbs. Well, we cannot talk about suburbs in the 1950s without talking about Levittown. This was a development in New York and Long Island. They were cookie-cutter houses in suburban Long Island, and they were duplicated in many other cities. So if you were to look at these houses, they all were built in very similar fashion. They were three to four bedrooms. They had one bathroom. Um, these houses were essentially replicas. And the neighborhood I live in was built in – my house was built in 1964. It's a one-story, three-bedroom house. It's very, very similar to every other house in my neighborhood. So look around your neighborhood. If all the houses are the same, they are. that's kind of modeled after a Levittown in which these houses were quickly mass produced. Unfortunately for a sign of the times, African Americans were forbidden from buying homes in Levittown and many other suburbs as well. Something This term white flight you should be familiar with as many white families moving from the from the cities to the suburbs and again many african americans were excluded from that and blacks especially those from the south are moving to the cities as well middle class families in the 1950s saw that many married women did not work this was reinforced in television shows such as leave it to beaver and other shows that were popular during that time dr benjamin spock wrote a very famous book baby and child care in this talked about the belief that raising children should be child-centered. It was something like one out of every five women had this book in their homes. The cult of domesticity is a term you should be familiar with, and this was the idea that women were expected to stay home and raise a family. Pretty similar to this idea of, of Republican motherhood, which has been around for a very long time. When we're talking about TV in the 1950s, 40 million TVs were in America by 1957. You were more likely to have in your house a TV than a refrigerator. Crazy, huh? And the advertising industry increases as well. There's a whole industry built around ads for television. TV, according to Alan Brinkley, this is a great quote, was also contributing to the sense of alienation and powerlessness among groups excluded from the world it portrays that's on page 790 of the 14th edition 
And what this is saying is that many African Americans and other minorities are going to be watching TV and they will see this world that they are excluded from. And they will want to be a part of that world, which will help lead to the civil rights movement of the 1950s and the 1960s. So white collar jobs, when we're talking about white collar jobs, those are people that work in office jobs, outnumber blue collar jobs or manufacturing jobs in the 1950s for the first time in U.S. history. Schools increase focus on math and science, again, thanks to Sputnik. The beat generation generation were a group of writers that criticized middle class values and conformity in the 1950s. You should definitely be familiar with this guy, Jack Kerouac, and his book On the Road. And the beats were very similar to the lost generation of the 1920s. That has been a multiple choice question before, either comparing the beats in the lost generation or just one of them. Definitely know that they criticize middle class values and society of their respective decades. Rock and roll music of the 1950s were, was influenced by African American music, and Elvis Presley becomes famous during this time, and he brought sexuality to the forefront of American society. His dancing was very provocative for that time, and many times on television, cameramen were directed to only tape him from the waist up. Let's talk about The Other America. This book, titled The Other America by Michael Harrington, will play an important role during LBJ's administration. And this book brought attention to poverty, and this influenced LBJ's great society. And in this book, it argued that 25% of the nation and 40% of African Americans lived in poverty. Those are very high numbers. One out of four Americans, two out of five African Americans were living in poverty. And also, Native Americans were the poorest group in America during this time. When we're talking about inner cities, due to the growth of suburbs, many cities became run down or ghettos. And unfortunately, many African Americans are forced to live only in cities because, again, they were excluded from suburbs. There is a focus in the 1950s on urban renewal, which is an effort to rebuild poor areas of cities. So, Civil rights movement really begins to take steam in the 1950s, but it has some roots in the 1940s, including in 1948 when Truman desegregated the military with Executive Order 9981. Also during World War II, we had the Double V campaign, and here are some Double V soldiers, which in the Double V stood for victory over fascism abroad and victory over racism at home. Definitely be familiar with this. So many African Americans were fighting in, the war, in World War II, not only in the hopes of defeating Germany and Japan and, and the enemies during World War II, but to come home and have more rights for themselves as well. I do have a video on Brown versus the Board of Education. Check it out in the description below. This monumental court case ended the separate but equal doctrine that was established by Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896. The Supreme Court stated that schools must desegregate with all deliberate speed. Now that's open for interpretation. What does all deliberate speed mean? Well, southern states responded with what's known as massive resistance. And many southern schools shut down rather than desegregate. And you had over 90 members of Congress sign something called the Southern Manifesto, which was written by Senator Harry Byrd. And this stated that the Supreme Court overstepped its boundaries. And they talked about nowhere in the Constitution is education mentioned. And it's not even mentioned in the 14th Amendment. So the Southerners, the Southern Congress people, believe that the Supreme Court overstepped its boundaries. This leads to, in 1957, a situation known as the Little Rock Nine, in which Arkansas, Little Rock High School in Arkansas, did not allow nine African-American students to enter high school. So Eisenhower nationalized the Arkansas National Guard, and he sent troops to escort the Little Rock Nine to school. Let's continue with the civil rights movement in the 1950s. Well, we're talking about the Montgomery bus boycott. This is on December 1st. Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat, and here is Rosa Parks. And look over her right shoulder. Who do you see there? a young Martin Luther King. He's only 26 years old at this time, and he drew on ideas from Jesus, Thoreau, and Gandhi, this idea of civil disobedience, breaking unjust laws and suffering the consequences as a result. 
this bus boycott lasts for a year, and one year after Rosa Parks was arrested, Montgomery buses were finally desegregated. Now, let's go back to that quote I talked about with TV before. When we're talking about TV and the civil rights, TV demonstrated how whites lived, and this helped inspire activism to achieve similar living conditions for minorities, especially African Americans. And the Cold War also helped contribute to the civil rights movement, because there's this question, is the U.S. really a better country than the Soviet Union if there is discrimination and racism in the United States. That's what many people are going to ask. All right, we're going to talk about Eisenhower here, and his Secretary of State was this guy, John Foster Dulles, and he believed in a policy known as massive retaliation, which is this idea of if the United States is attacked, they will go full nuclear mode on the Soviet Union or any other country. This leads to a state of affairs known as brinkmanship when you're constantly on the edge of war. Now in 1954, DMB and Foo Falls, then we have Rock on the Clock, Einstein, James Dean, Brooklyn's Got a Winning Team, Davy Crockett and Peter Pan, Elvis Presley, Disneyland, Bardo, Budapest, Alabama, Cruise Chef, Princess Grace, Pey- Peyton Place, Trouble in the Suez. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, it's probably because I was a horrible singer just there, but that's Billy Joel's We Didn't Start the Fire, which he covers Many, many important things from the 1940s up to and including 1989. I have a link to the lyrics in the description below. Check it out. It is one of my favorite songs ever. I was seven years old when that came out, and I memorized it in the summer going into second grade. I vividly remember playing that song over and over and over on my little handheld Walkman. That's enough about me. So Dan Bien Phu is a city in Vietnam, and France leaves Vietnam. After the fall of Dien Bien Phu, they lose this battle. So the United States is afraid that Vietnam could turn communist. So the U.S. begins to increase its presence there. This really begins under Eisenhower. Eisenhower also issues what's known as the Eisenhower Doctrine. And this is this fear that communism could spread to Middle Eastern countries. So he will help resist the spread of communism to Middle East countries. And the president could provide military and economic aid to nations resisting communism. So many doctrines, minus the Monroe Doctrine, are all about resisting communism. Think back to the Truman Doctrine. What two countries did the Truman Doctrine deal with? Think about it. Think about it. Tell me now. Good. You said Turkey and Greece. You should absolutely know that. Iran during the 1950s sees the overthrow of the leader Mossadegh, who was elected by the citizens of Iran, and this was overthrown by the CIA. He was overthrown by the CIA, and they later instituted this guy, Shah Pahlavi, over here, and we'll come back to him with the Iran hostage crisis in 1979. The Suez crisis occurs in the 1950s when Egyptian President Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal or took it over, and France, Britain, and Israel attacked. Egypt. The U.S. did not support this, and then France, Britain, and Israel withdrew from there. The U.S. also overthrew a president of Guatemala, Arbenz. He nationalized a whole bunch of land owned by a U.S. fruit company. This is known as the Banana Wars because this U.S. fruit company had a lot of land for banana plantations, and the U.S. overthrew him because they were afraid that he was communist. All right, let's talk about Cuba. U.S businesses in Cuba owned a significant amount of land and resources. And on January 1st, 1951, Fidel Castro comes to power. He overthrows the leader Batista. Castro and the USSR, the Soviet Union, grew very close, and the U.S. cut ties with Cuba. And this is going to be a problem for JFK's administration, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. The Hungarian Revolt happens in the 1950s, and Hungarian citizens sought democratic reforms. And the Soviet Union quickly crushed this revolution, but the U.S. did not intervene. They allowed this to happen. One of the last things to happen under Eisenhower's administration was a U-2 spy plane, very similar to this one, was shot down on May 1st, 1960 over the Soviet Union airspace. The U.S. and Soviet Union planned a series of planned summits in which Eisenhower and Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union, would meet. And before the final meeting took place, the, the Soviet Union shot down this plane, which was piloted by Francis Gary Powers and Khrushchev canceled the further planned meetings. All right, let's do a quick recap of this chapter. Definitely no Levittowns were mass-produced houses in suburbs and white flight because African Americans were not allowed in Levittowns. Sputnik helped kick off the space race, which the Soviet Union was up quite a bit in the beginning. 
Interstate highway system was created under Eisenhower, which created over 40,000 miles worth of roads and helped spur many industries. The beat generation in the 1950s criticized middle class values. The double V campaign was a civil rights campaign at home during World War II and a victory campaign over the Nazis during World War II as well. Brown versus the board of education reversed Plessy and said that separate but equal is not okay when it comes to education. Massive resistance is the way that many Southern schools responded to this decision by shutting down. The Southern Manifesto stated that the Supreme Court overstepped its boundaries in the Brown versus Board decision. And the Eisenhower Doctrine is is the policy of the United States defending countries in the Middle East from becoming communist. The fall of Dien Bien Phu in 1954 means that France leaves Vietnam and the United States presence there increases. And the United States also overthrew a leader in Iran and installed the Shah of Iran, who will become uh, again, a key figure in the 1979 hostage crisis. And finally, the U-2 spy plane was shot down on, during Eisenhower's administration and led to increased tensions with the Soviet Union. And don't forget about Cuba as well. Castro comes to power in 1950. All right, that's everything you need to know about Chapter 20 of American History. Please take a moment and subscribe to my channel if you have not already. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button and also share this with as many people as possible that you think would benefit from this. Thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the section below. And have a good day, guys.